Well, good evening and welcome again to our Wednesday night dinner. Thank you guys for joining us on tonight, especially those that are on our conference call. Good to have you to call in on tonight. And for those that have joined us on Facebook Live, it's good to have you to be with us in our Wednesday night dinner uh, as we study the Word of God together. Now, we are still talking about our theme for this year, to know Christ uh, and to make Him known. And we have taken our Wednesday nights to look at Jesus in the Old Testament. And we have looked at that from a several standpoints, but tonight I want to look at uh, Jesus or uh, the prophecy of Jesus' birth from the Old Testament. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. So I encourage you, if you got your Bibles uh, not handy, uh, go get them and bring them close to you. Get your paper and your pen and take notes as we go along uh, tonight. Let's ask God's blessing upon our study together tonight. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be able to come together tonight. Father, we ask that you be with us in our study. We pray that you would open our hearts to receive your word. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that illuminates your word in our lives. So again, Father, we ask your richest blessings upon this study. Be with me as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Got your Bibles? You have turned to the book. Well, I didn't give you a book yet. But we want to be going back in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, if you just want to be turning back to Genesis, you can. We're, we want to start uh, in the book of Genesis. Now, what we want to do tonight, this week, uh, we're going to look at prophets of Jesus' birth in the Old Testament. Next week, we're going to look at the fulfillment of those prophecies. In the New Testament, okay? So tonight, we're going to look at the prophecies of Jesus' birth in the Old Testament. Next week, we're going to flip to the New Testament and look at the fulfillment of those prophecies. Now, I got several Old Testament prophecies tonight about the birth of Jesus. I probably won't make it through all of them, but I will give you the scriptures so that you can go ahead and jot them down, read them on your own. So tonight in Genesis chapter 3, that's why we want to begin. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We want to look at the first prophecy of the birth of Jesus. Now in Genesis 3, 15, the Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. Now, from the very beginning, right after Adam and Eve disobeyed God, God gave indication that a Savior would be coming up from the seed of the woman, Eve. Now God revealed right away that this seed would be the one that would crush the head of the serpent. And you know and I know that this seed pointed to Jesus. So when we look at the promise in Genesis 3.15, it is addressed to the serpent and not to mankind. Amen. Now I want you to notice that. That is so important. That this promise in Genesis 3.15 is addressed to the serpent. It's not addressed to mankind. Amen. Now how do I know that? If you go back to Genesis 3 verse 14. Yes. Since you're already there, just go back up one verse. Genesis 3.14 is part of the sentence of the judgment 
that's passed on the one who is the enemy of both God and man. Though it contained in the seed form a promise of mankind, it is born directly a sentence of judgment on the serpent, clearly a reference to Satan. This teaches us that God's plan is about God's rule as much as man's need. Amen. Now, we note from Genesis 3.15 that the struggle is between the, ser the serpent and the woman. It is between his seed and her seed. And between a single individual and the serpent. So when you look at the text, the text says, And I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, Eve. He, the seed of the woman, shall bruise you, the serpent, on the head. And you, the serpent shall bruise him, the seed of the woman, on his heel. Now, Adam, where is Adam doing all of this time? Where is Adam doing this conversation here? And the promise that's made in this conversation with Satan. See, Adam is simply and plainly passed over. Now, the reason for this is not given here in Genesis chapter 3. But as you journey through history yes, sir. in the light of God's revelation, you will both identify the serpent and you will show why Adam is passed over. Yes. Now, you say, well, why is Adam passed over? Adam is passed over because the reason for Genesis 3.15 is all about a virgin birth. It's a birth without a man. So when you look at this passage, Genesis 3.15, we see in this passage the anticipation of the virgin birth. Deliverance would come from the woman without the aid of a man. And that's why you find the first recorded instance of the birth of Jesus in Genesis 3.15. And you may say, well, I don't see Jesus in that passage. Well, if you study the passage and understand what is this virgin birth and who is the virgin birth and who is it that's going to crush the head of the serpent? When you get to the fulfillment, yes, yes we'll get yes. to that next week. Yes, yes. When you get to the fulfillment, then you'll understand who it is that he's talking about. Here in Genesis 3 and verse number 15. So the first scripture that I want to leave with you tonight is when you talk about the virgin with the birth of Jesus in the Old Testament, it starts in Genesis 3 verse 15. Now let's look at another passage tonight. In the book of Isaiah chapter 7. Verse number 14. Now I'm going to give you time to flip over there. Isaiah chapter 7 and the verses number 14. Very familiar passage to those that are students of the Bible. But I really need you to turn there because I'm going to read several passages, several verses out of this passage. Because when you look at Isaiah 7, 14. The Bible said, therefore will the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. 
Now, in order to understand Isaiah 7, 14, you have to keep this verse in the context of Isaiah chapter 7 for several reasons. The first reason is, look at the first word. Therefore. What's the first word in verse number 14? Therefore. It's therefore. Now, how do you want to understand what's going to follow the therefore unless you know what the therefore is there for? So, in order to understand verse 14, you have to look at the context of, of Isaiah chapter 7. What I want to do is back, back up to verse 3. Because I want to keep verse 14 in the context of why Isaiah even says this, okay? Now, in verse 3, back, back up with me. We're going to look at these verses. And I hope I can take my time so that we can all understand now when you get to verse 14. Verse 3 says, And the Lord, and said the Lord unto Isaiah, I want you now to go and meet Azaz. Thou, and, and talk about his son, Jehazahab, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool, in the highway of the fuller's field. Verse 4. And say unto him, Take heed, be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tails of these smoking firebands, for the furious anger of resin of Syria, and of the sons of uh, Remelia. Now, let, let me kind of help you see what's going on. Isaiah here is prophesying to a king by the name of Uzzah. Uh, you could say Az has or Azar, but as has, he, he's the king of, of the southern tribe uh, in Judah. He is a very wicked king. Okay, we want to learn that. So Isaiah is prophesying to him. And he tells him, don't, don't be afraid because uh, there are going to be some other kings that's going to come up against him. But he said they're going to be smoking fire bad. They, they, they're not going to be able to set you on fire. The fire of them is going out. All you see is just a smothering smoke of these two. But then I'll drop down to verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, As the assign, of the Lord thy God. As it either in the depth. Or in the height. Above. Now here's what Isaiah is telling the king. He said. Now what you need to do. Ahaz, is ask God for a son. He said. And you can ask him whatever you want. He said. Notice he says. Either in the depth. Or in the deep, or whether or not it's in the height, it's, 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 it's in heaven. What he's telling Ahaz is ask God whatever you want. I mean, from the depths or the pits of Sheol to the very height of heaven itself, anywhere in between, ask God and watch what God do. But you want to know what this guy said. Notice verse number 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tip the Lord. Now why would he not ask God for a sign? Let me tell you why he wouldn't ask God for a sign. See, Ahaz, true reason, for declining was his resolve not to do God's will. See, this guy really didn't want to do what God said. He wanted to do his own thing, his own way. 
The reason why he didn't want to ask God was because he wanted to negotiate with the Assyrians and persevere in his idolatry. Because he knew if he had asked God, God would have told him what to do, which would have been the right thing to do. Ahaz did not want to do what was right. How do I know that? Well, I got again, take you to some other passages. Now, we're going to get to verse 14, but I want to lead you up to verse 14 so that you'll really understand what's going on in Isaiah chapter 7 and why the statement is made in verse number 7. A couple of scriptures I want to give you. You ain't got to turn to these, but the first one is going to be found in 2 Chronicles chapter 28. And I want to look at verse number 22 and verse 23. Notice what the Bible says. And in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? We talking about Ahaz here. When he got in trouble, guess what he did? He got further and further away from God. Instead of coming to God, instead of calling upon God, he went further from God. He didn't do as his ancestor David. You remember David said when he was in distress, he called out unto the Lord and he heard his cry. But, but Ahaz did not do that. He said, I'm not going to cry out. I'm not going to call. And, and, and in his trouble, he got further and further from God. Now notice verse 23. For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, because the God of the king of Syria helped them. Therefore will I sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and all of Israel. You know what this king is saying? He's simply saying that I'm going to call on the gods of Assyria. Because see, these gods of Assyria, of Syria help them. So if they help them, guess what? They'll help me. So instead of him calling on Yahweh, Jehovah God, he calls on the little G gods of Assyria. And look at what happened. He said he sacrificed to them and he would pray in and ask them that they would help him. But they didn't. Another passage that I want to run by you tonight is found in 2 Kings chapter 16. Now we learn about this king Ahaz, because this is the conversation in Isaiah chapter 7. I need to know a little bit about this guy, so when I get to verse 14, it'll all start to make sense. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 16, let me begin with verse 2. Let, I'm going to read several verses, because verse 2 says, 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign. And he reigned for 16 years in Jerusalem and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord, his God, like David, his father, did. Now, I want you to notice something. The Bible says he reigned for 16 years. He was 20 years old. But he did not do that which was right in the sight of God. Now, most, if you got any knowledge of Old Testament, uh, the prophets and kings, most of the kings in Judah, the southern Israel, did what was right. It was only those in the northern that was just heathens. But this guy, did not do what was right. He was taking his lead from those kings that was in the north. And he did not do like David. Verse 3 said, but he, 
Ahaz walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Talking about the northern tribes. Yet yeah, he made his sons pass through the fire according to the abomination of the heathens whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Now we just kind of getting a little background about this king Ahaz. He sacrificed his own children, passed him through the fire. But verse 4 says, And have had sacrifice and burnt incense in the high places on the hills under every green tree. I mean, you're talking about a guy that just went off. He's doing everything contrary to the word and the will of God. Verse 5 said, And Resin, king of Syria, and Pesach, king of Remelia, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war. And they besieged Ahaz, but they could not overcome him. And at that time, Resin, king of Syria, recovered Elshad of Syria, drained drove out the Jews uh, from Arphath and the Syrians came to Arphath and dwelt there in the day. So as I sent messengers to uh, Tia has Philiar, king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and son. Come up and save me from the hands of Syria. Come out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. Now notice what he's doing. He's going up to the king of Assyria. And he's telling him, I'm your servant. Well, what about the servant of the most high God? Why can you not the servant of Yahweh? Why come you not his son? But this king was so wicked. He said, I am your servant, king of Assyria. I'm your son, and I want you to come up and save me. Now verse 8 said, and Ahaz took silver. He took gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent it for present to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria hearkened unto him. For the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it and carried the people captive to care. And he slew the king resting. But then you get to verse 10. And the king Ahaz went to Damascus to meet the king of Assyria. And he saw an altar that was at Damascus. And being the king he took and, and went to the priest and he fashioned an altar after the pattern of the one that he saw in Damascus. And he had all the woodsmen and the craftsmen and the workmen to make one just like he saw in Damascus. Now, this is the guy we're talking about here in Isaiah chapter 7. Now, you get a glimpse of him here in 2 Kings 16, you get a glimpse of him in, in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 28. Now that you kind of got a little background about this king Ahaz, now let's go back to Isaiah chapter 7, okay? Now let's go back to chapter 7. Let's, let's pick up with verse 13. Y'all back there yet? And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Now, again, Isaiah's questioning in this guy. I like that version from the NLT because the NLT version puts it this way. Then, Isaiah said, listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust 
the patience of my God as well? What is he saying? He's simply saying, you have wearied men with your rebellious attitude. And men have gotten tired of you. And guess what? You have exhausted the patience of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I never want to exhaust the patience of God. So Isaiah asked the king, will you, must you also exalt the patience of my God as well? But then you get to verse 14. Amen. Now you see the word therefore. Therefore what? Therefore, after all that you have heard about this king, and everything you have heard about him, even Isaiah said, now you need to ask God for a sign. God will give you a sign in what to do. He'll do for you just like he did for Hezekiah. When he asked, Hezekiah asked for a sign and God caused the shadow of the sun to go backwards, you remember that instead of forward? He said, God will give you a sign if you just ask. But you remember what he said? I will not ask God for a sign. Well, why not? A has because I'm going to stay with Assyria. They're going to help me. They're going to bless me. They're going to get me out of this jam that I'm, that I'm in. So therefore, I'm not going to ask God for no sign. Not going to do it. Well, when you get to verse 14, verse 14 says, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. You know what he's saying? He said, okay. I just said, okay, Azad, if you don't want to ask God for a sign, if you too stubborn and ignorant to ask God for a sign, the Lord himself is going to give you a sign. But what is that sign he's going to give him? He says, behold. See that word behold? Actually come from the Greek word which literally pronounced hene. Hene uh, really means to look. It means to see. It means something that is for surety or for certain. He said, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, who is Isaiah talking about here in verse 14? Who is this virgin that's going to give a son that he's talking about? 700 years before Mary had the baby Jesus, Isaiah prophesied that a virgin was going to have a baby. And that son, his name is going to be Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. So he said, if you won't ask for a sign, God will give you a sign. And here's a sign that God is going to give. That a virgin is going to have a baby. Amen. Going to have a son. Even Pacific, not just a daughter, but have a son. Now, again, keep this prophecy along with Genesis 3.15. I think when you put them together, you, you're going to find a trend that we are leading somewhere. Amen. And we are leading to the New Testament and the fulfillment. Because see, this scripture points to the manner in which he will be born. And it also gives us the name that he's going to have. And that name is going to be Emmanuel. The name of Christ, the name of the Messiah. Okay? The name is not Christ. Christ means who he is, what he does. He is the Messiah. 
but his name going to be Emmanuel. Meaning God with us. This was pointed both to his human birth and to his divine nature. And as I said earlier, it was written 700 years before the Christ was born. So we have looked then at Genesis 3, 15, and we have looked at Isaiah 7, verse 14. Let me give you a couple of more before my time run out. In Isaiah 9, if we just flip over a couple of chapters, at verse number 6, again, a very well uh, familiar passage. The Bible says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Yes, sir. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Yes, sir. Counselor. Yes. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Now, who is he talking about here? Who is, who is Isaiah talking about here in Isaiah 9 and verse number 6? We found out who he's talking about in Isaiah 7, 14. But who is he talking about here in 9 and 6? Again, when we get to the fulfillment, we'll know exactly who he's referring to and who he's talking to. Matter of fact, you can see it right here in this verse. Notice how this verse starts out. It said, unto us a child is born, but unto us a son is given. I don't know if you picked up anything on that or not. Note it. Child is born, but a son is given. Yes, sir. You see? The child is going to be born, huh. but he's also going to be given. Yes. Now, what's the difference? Oh, yes, he sir. was given yes, before yes, he was born. Yes, sir. He was born, and we get to the New Testament, in the stable. But he was given to us long time ago. So here we have a child born and a son given. given. Good teacher. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And we'll talk about that when we look at the fulfillment of this passage. Amen. Let me give you a few more passages before we close. In Isaiah 11, now we went to 7, we went to 9, now we're going to jump over to 11. In Isaiah 11 in verse 1, the Bible said, And there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Now, who is he talking about? What is that shoot that's going to come from the stump of Jesse? Well, again, he's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus, the Christ. We'll look more into that. But let me give you another one. In the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse number 2. Okay? You may want to just jot this one down. Go back and read it, especially if you can't find it right quick. But let me just kind of read it to you. In the book of Michael 5 and 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephraim, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth has come from old, from everlasting. Now again, who is the prophet Micah? Referring to. Who is he talking about? The key to understanding that is understanding Bethlehem. Where is he going to come from? From Bethlehem. Now that ought to let us know who he is talking about. Because we know Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And this scripture tells us in advance the place where Jesus is going to be born. Again, Micah prophesied this approximately 800 years 
before Jesus was born. So we see then that there are several prophecies about the birth of Jesus in the Old Testament that leads us to the New Testament. That's why you hear me so often times say, if you got some knowledge of the Old Testament, it just opens up the new. But if you have no knowledge of the old, the New Testament, for some of us, is going to be very difficult to really understand the author's meaning. Well, what is he talking about? But if I know something about the old, a lot of times the new makes a lot more sense. Now understand why Paul says in Romans 15 and verse 4, Paul said the things written aforetime, they was written for what purpose? They was written for the purpose of our learning. We need to learn from the Old Testament. So that's why I encourage you, spend some time in the Old Testament. Read the Old Testament. Study the Old Testament. Because it's going to really enlighten you when you get to the new. Alright? Now let me give you a couple of more and we're going to close. In the book of Hosea, chapter number 13. May chapter 11, Hosea 11 and verse 1. He talks about him being called out of Egypt. He said, I call my son out of Egypt. Now, what is Isaiah, man, Hosea referring to? Well, actually, when you look at Hosea's prophecy, again, about 800 years before Jesus was born, this verse here can actually look backwards as well as looking forward. The reason I say that because you remember that the Israelites were slaves down in Egypt and God brought them out of Egypt by the hands of Moses. You remember that? But it also can point forward to talk about Joseph and Mary because you remember when Herod was out to kill, you know, the, the babies? And, and the angel told Joseph and Mary to flee where? Into Egypt. And they took the baby Jesus into Egypt. So you can look at this verse, actually a prophecy that could be forward or backwards. But I like the forward part because God calls his son. Not just his people, the Israelites, but he called his son out of Egypt. Because when Herod died, the angel appeared and said, okay, you guys can come out of Egypt. So here we have another prophecy by an Old Testament prophet that tells us about the son that came out of Egypt which was Jesus. Well, I see my time is about up. Let me give you some other scriptures that you jot down. You can read these before next week. Kind of enhance your knowledge just a little bit more. I want you to jot down Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and verse number 6. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and verse 6. Then, then Jeremiah 31 and verse number 15. Because see, Jeremiah is also going to talk about what's going to take place and then with this baby, Jesus. Psalm 72, verse 9. Psalm 72, verse 10 and verse 11. And lastly, I want you to jot down the book, the, the scripture, Malachi. Chapter 3 and verse number 1, okay? Malachi 3 and verse 1. Now, I ain't got time to go through all of those tonight. Go ahead, jot them down, read them, okay? So when we come back together next week, we're going to be looking at the fulfillment of these prophecies in the New Testament, okay? Now, we talked about the prophecy of the baby, of the birth of Jesus, from the Old Testament. 
Next week, we'll look at the fulfillment of those prophecies. Okay, I see my time is up. Hope you guys enjoyed our study together tonight. Again, when you look at Isaiah 7, 14, again, I pray that you keep it in the context. Understand what's going on. Understand who Isaiah is talking to and why he's talking to this king. And the problem the king had is why he says what he says in verse 14. Okay, thank you guys for joining being with us tonight. Enjoy being with you uh, as well. Let's end with a prayer uh, on tonight. Father, again, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for our study. Together, we pray, Father, that you will continue to watch over us throughout this night. Father, we pray that you give us all a peaceful night's rest and we'll be able to arise and see another beautiful day uh, on tomorrow. Again, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. Good night, everyone.